Welcome to the Dell Wamsley Radio Show. <laughs> Dell challenges the status quo, questions everything, and empowers you to return to your core beliefs to make your life better. If you're ready to hear the truth and get your roadmap to the lifestyle you really want, the next hour will change your life. And now your host, self-made millionaire, national award-winning investor of the year, CEO and founder of Lifestyles Unlimited, Del Wamsley. Welcome to the Del Wamsley Radio Show, where the hype ends and the help begins. I'm your host, Del Wamsley, and as always, we're working on your financial freedom. Today, I want to talk about something that I think is probably one of the most important separators of successful people from people that fail or have less than the amount of success they'd like to have. And I believe that term is called fear. Now, we have an acronym for fear. We call it false evidence appearing real, but it's out there. A wise man once said, there's no monster that could be as terrible as what we perceive monsters to be. Uh, The reality is, is that there is a tremendous number of different kinds of things that you can be afraid of. We're all afraid of things like failure, uh, lack of success, embarrassment, uh, you know, you name it, there's a lot of things you can be afraid of, right? But a guy the other day sent me an article, and one of my friends sent me an article that I thought was very interesting where this guy discusses fear in a little bit different manner than I've worked with it before in the past. So I'm going to cover it his way and work through it with you on this type of situation. It's a very interesting little deal. Um, that his point is, is that you can't overcome fear and that successful people realize that you cannot overcome fear so you simply fear it and do it anyway people that are not successful or have less success than what they would like to have they allow fear to stop them from taking action and then they wait until they are no longer fearful. So you hear lots of people that come to Lifestyle say, well, you know, I'm going to research you. I'm going to do my due diligence. I'm going to look at everything I can find on the Internet. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to talk to these people. I'm going to talk to those people. I'm going to, you know, meet as many members as I can. And what they're really saying is I'm afraid. I'm afraid I'm going to make a mistake. I'm afraid that I'm going to be cheated. I'm afraid I'm going to be made look a fool, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so in their mind, this type of fear is a protection for them. It's protecting them from making a mistake of some kind. Uh, The fear, an embarrassment of going up and meeting someone, like, for instance, if you're out on a, you know, at a bar and you wanted to go and meet a lovely lady the other side of the room, the fear that you're going to get turned down, the fear that you're going to be rejected is another type of fear. All of these fear based situations are keeping you from taking action. Yes, you might get turned down. And yes, you might fail at what you attempt to do. But if you don't try, then we know what the outcome is. I can guarantee you 100% of the time that you will not fail if you do not try. And that's the reality that we're living with in this world. So why is this so poignant for me right now? Why is it so timely? It's because this week, I'm putting offers on three different Class A apartment complexes that total close to $100 million. I mean, this is insane for me. I can't even imagine $100 million. The last apartment complex I bought cost me like $5 million. And now I'm looking at like $100 million of purchases uh, going down at the same time. And quite honestly, I feel the fear. There's no doubt about it. I feel it. But that's not going to stop me. I'm going to go ahead and take the action anyway, because I need to get to the other side of that fear. So this guy was talking about, you know, fear and how it affects you and so forth. And I started thinking about, okay, what do we need to do to overcome fear? What kind of an exercise would work today to work on overcoming fear? And I thought about it. The first thing you need to do in your mind is you need to think back to situations that you were traumatically fearful of, and then look at how they came out. Did you take action and did you overcome that fear? And I started thinking, well, we just talk about financial decisions. No, I think you got to think about all the stuff in your life that you were afraid of that just really scared the living bejeebers out of you. And you took action to overcome that fear. 
And it's, it's a bizarre, bizarre, bizarre story when you start looking at it that way. I remember the first thing that I ever feared was that my mother was uh, psychologically not well. Uh, I don't know what to call it. She was schizophrenic, she was bipolar, a bunch of stuff. And she was also an alcoholic and a prescription drug addict. My dad was a workaholic. And my dad loved my mother profusely, thought that, she, you know, she hung the moon. And so my dad would be gone all day long and my mother would be drugged up all day long. And all she'd do all day long was yell at me. And she'd make me do all of the kitchen work, all of the you know females work in the family. She made me babysit my little sister. And no matter what I did, I did it wrong. And for years, I lived under this abuse. And I was afraid to tell my dad about it because he loved her and thought she hung the moon. And it got to the point where my mother got so weirded out that she thought I was psychologically unstable because I wouldn't be her little slave to the point that she wanted me to be. And so she took me to a child psychologist. And I remember being there and sitting out in the hall while my parents went in and told these lies to this person, the psychiatrist. And then the psychiatrist called me in and said, so what's your story? And I told him, I finally just said, you know what? This is where I make my stand. This big adult person can protect me from these other big adult people. I'm going to try it. I'm going to make the stand and tell the truth. And I told the guy what the story was, how she abused me, uh, psychologically abused me constantly, uh, how my dad would beat me because she would tell him that I was a bad person. And it was just unbelievable. So the guy, you know, I'm sure you, you sit here, you hear this from a kid, you hear it from an adult. He's got to make a, a, a psychological decision which one's lying? Because my mother told him that I was a constant liar, that I lied about everything, which is absolutely the opposite of the truth. I'm a constant teller of the truth, which gets me in more trouble than anything. So after my consultation with the doctor, we walked back out. And when I walked out, my mother yelled at me and said, why is your sister's coat on the ground? I remember it like it was yesterday. Why did you let her put it on the ground? It's all dirty. And I turned right around to the doctor and I looked him in the face and said, do you understand what's going on here? Doctor, listen to me. I've been in there with you. And yet they're blaming me for what my sister did, which was to throw her coat on the dirty ground. Do you see what my mother is doing me? And at that point, the doctor called my parents back in the room and chewed them out. Quite literally chewed them out right there. And eventually my mother ended up going to a psychology clinic or psycho ward clinic and had shock therapy because back then that's what they did. They did like frontal lobotomies or something. But that was my first great stand as a human being, little kid standing up against adults. But that little stand showed me that you fear everything in this world. As a young kid, I was fearful of everything that was going to occur. I was going to get beaten. I was going to get in trouble. I was going to whatever. And that stand got me through. So my friends, you got to think about that kind of stuff. Where did you start breaking your fears and found out that the other side of that fear was success? That's the kind of thing. Now, that's a, a very deep one. I Hope that you guys can understand that I'm sharing a very personal emotion. But that was the beginning of me realizing you've got to break fears. You've got to beat them. Um, another fear I had was when I first went to high school, the first day I was there, second day I was there. Uh, no, it wasn't first. It was like the first dance of the year. And I was with my friend, and I'm walking down the hall, and all these seniors, which looked like they're like 2,000 miles tall and twice, three times the weight we were, uh, were sitting there with my friend and they were talking to my friend. And I, don't, I couldn't tell what they were doing. I thought there was a friendly chat. I walked up and I said, hey, what's going on, man? And this guy turned around and hit me in the mouth and knocked me down. And the guy said, who invited you over here? Get out of here. I'm going to kick your, you know what. And so, man, I'm, I'm bleeding. I'm walking away and I'm like, what is going on? And this was the school bully, the senior school bully that everybody in the school was afraid of. And so at that point, it was like I was afraid this guy was going to find me and literally obliterate me. And for days, I hid from him. You know, I'd make sure that I looked down the hall before I went, that there was no him or none of his gang were there. And finally, one day, I was just sitting and I was so afraid and so tired of being afraid that I thought to myself, I'm just going to go up to this guy and say, hey, if you want to kick my you know what, then let's get it done because I'm tired of being afraid of you. And so I went into the commons area, which is where everybody would go between classes. 
And I walked up to him and said, hey, look, man, I am really tired of being afraid of you. Either kick my butt or just leave me alone. The guy looked at me and laughed with all of his friends. And he goes, dude, you're not worth getting in trouble kicking your butt for. You're a punk. Now get out of here. I don't want to see you ever again. And that was it. I walked away with my head in the air thinking, I did it. I overcame fear. We'll take a short break. Be right back with the Dell Wamsley Radio Show. You're listening to the Dell Wamsley Radio Show. Dell will be right back with more life-changing principles in just a few minutes. Welcome back. Now here's some more unconventional wisdom to set you free from the man on a mission to retire America one person at a time. Dell Wamsley. Welcome back to the Dell Wamsley Radio Show. Today we're discussing fear and how it stops people in their tracks and how you should try to overcome fear and how that process is what it's really all come all about. You're never going to get rid of fear. Fear doesn't ever go away. You just learn to overcome it by taking action anyway. You think about military people. You think guys running into a spray of bullets and bombs ever really overcome that fear? No, they just have been trained to do it anyway and realize that the greatest possibility of success is to not get rattled while you're in the middle of whatever it is you're taking action on. So I'm talking about what we need to do is to look back at the fears we have overcome in our life and how they helped us to change our lives so that you can then focus on, and this is going to be the second part of what we want to do today, is we want to focus on the fears that are right now standing in front of us, keeping us from going further. And the point I'm making is that I've lived a life of a series of fears were overcome, and each time I overcome a fear, it strengthened my resolve to continue to grow and be successful. So the next fear that I found myself looking into was when I had a boss. I had a boss that was terrible. The boss said, look, you're lucky to have a job. Uh, you know, you have no college education. Working in this health club is the only thing you can do or ever will be able to do. Uh, you should be thankful every single day that you even have a job, period. He just constantly rode me, constantly degraded me, even though I was one of his best employees and made the company the most money of, you know, higher level group of guys that were supervisors. My s- division was way more profitable than most of the other divisions. And so... You know, I had this fear over and over again, working 12 hours a day, six days a week, and I started investing in real estate. So I went out and I put money in the stock market and I lost money in the stock market. And so I I thought, man, now I'm really afraid. Now I'm really afraid I'm going to have to work for the rest of my life, uh, 12, six, you know, 12 days, a week, 12 hours a day, six days a week. Now I'm really afraid that I'm never going to be able to save for retirement. You know, just all kinds of fear. And it was just acerbated by this boss that was just driving me crazy, right? So one day I finally just said to the guy, look, I'm quitting. I refuse to work six hours a day or 12 hours a day, six days a week for the rest of my life. I've just lost my savings. I just, I'm not going to do it for the rest of my life. There's no way. So I'm just going to quit and go get a job that's just 40 hours a week instead of 60 to 80 hours a week. And when I did that, it, it was so refreshing to be free of it. I remember walking away going, man, that felt so good. And the guy called me back. And because I was one of the best producers, he made a deal with me that I still had to work 12 hours a day because that's the way the system was. The gym's open at 9 in the morning, stayed open till 10 at night. So somebody had to work from 9 to 9 or 10 to 10 uh, every day. And uh, but he made a deal that I could work just four days a week. Um, what I would do is I would cover for the other managers when they took off so they could actually get off on Saturday and Sunday where they usually couldn't because they didn't have anybody to cover. So I would work Thursday and Friday and set up for the weekend and then I would have a, a great weekend. Well, I started having better weekends than they were having Monday through Fridays. And in other words, in four days, I was out producing guys working five days and it really became a blessing. I'm thinking to myself, look. Instead of working five and six days a week, 12 hours a day, I'm working only four days a week, which was still 48 hours, by the way, at 12 hours a day. Uh, And I'm producing more income for myself and for the company. Why didn't I make this decision earlier? 
it became so obvious to me that you had to overcome this fear sometimes to get where you want to go. You know things are wrong in your life. You're not where you want to be financially, but you're afraid to take the steps you need to take to get where you need to be. But you just won't because you're afraid. And so sometimes you just have to be afraid and do it anyway. So that went on for a while. That was good. Then I started enjoying my job again. And then I decided I need to overcome my fear of investing. And so I went out, took a bunch of courses on real estate, and I bought one rent house. That one rent house was fear times 1,000. The guy that was sold it to me, he basically beat me up to buy it. He insulted me. He told me everything. If you don't do this, you're going to be a loser. I mean, I go on and on on the stories, an incredible story. But he got me to buy this one rent house. And once I bought this first rent house and saw how easy it was to own a rent house, to buy it, to have a tenant, that it was money, mailbox money, and that I didn't have to do anything for the money, I go, man, why was I afraid of that? And then the next month, I bought three more because, you know, now I'd overcome that fear. But I was not overcoming that fear when I first started. So you would think, okay, now you've overcome fear of investing in real estate. And the answer is no, because then... I came across this opportunity to buy uh, five duplexes, and I didn't have enough money to buy it by myself, so I had to pick up some partners to go into this deal. And now I was afraid of something even scarier than losing my own money, and that was losing somebody else's money and being in trouble with somebody else about losing their money, either because uh, they might sue me or just be upset at me. But I found it devastatingly harder to invest other people's money than it does to invest mine. Because at least if I lose mine, I know it's my fault. I can go back to work. I can make some more money. Uh, But I had to overcome that fear because I didn't have enough money to buy this 10 units at one time. So I've got some other people to chip in and we bought it together as a group. I had to get an attorney. I had to set up a company. Uh, Things I had never thought I'd ever do. that was something that had to be done that I'd never done, and this whole process was scary. But no matter how scared I was, we went ahead and did it, and it became a very successful business. I think we bought the 10 units for 200000 we sold them for 450000 and we made, um, oh gosh, what was it? We were making $2,000 a month, about 24000 a year on uh, cash flow. And interestingly enough, we only put $25,000 down. So we put $25,000 down between all of us. We made $24,000 a year in cash flow for three years, which is about $75,000. And then we sold it for $450,000, which we'd bought it for $200,000. So it was a fantastically profitable deal. So you would think that by this point, I would be totally overcome of all fears to go out and buy real estate. But you're wrong. Because what I did was I made a decision early on in my investing career where I said, you know, Dell, you're never going to get rich slowly. You're going to have to get rich in large chunks. That's the only way it's going to work. So every time I bought something, I'd force myself to either buy more units or more profit. So in other words, if at the time my best deal was 2000 a month profit and it was 10 units, the next thing I bought had to be either more than 10 units or make more than $2,000 a month. And every transaction I did until I became rich, that was the rule of thumb that I had to stick with. So I bought 10 units. Then the next deal I did was 20 units. Then the next deal I did was 30, et cetera, et cetera, until I got up into the 320 unit property, the largest property I ever purchased at one time. And so what I want you to understand is, is that you're sitting there right now with these fears of some kind. Something is keeping you from taking action you need to take right now. You've got to start looking at what you've done in the past to overcome fear, to break through fear, to take action. And you've got to look at how much better your life is because you did that. Maybe it's asking your wife to marry you. Who knows? Let's take a short break. We'll be right back with the Dell Wamsley Radio Show. You're listening to the Dell Wamsley Radio Show. Dell will be right back with more life-changing principles in just a few minutes. Welcome back. Now here's some more unconventional wisdom to set you free from the man on a mission to retire America one person at a time. Dell Wamsley. Welcome back to the Dell Wamsley Radio Show. Today we're talking about 
the fact that fear is what's stopping most people from being as successful as they would like to be, and that you'll never overcome fear. Fear is not something that will ever go away. It's something you simply run into and then you go right through it. You have to take the action anyway, even though you fear it. So now we run into the question for the analytical people. This needs to be discussed is, so isn't fear a good thing? Doesn't that protect you? Isn't that a natural instinct? And the answer is yes, it does. And it, it makes you question every situation so that you might look at it more clearly. In fact, the opposite of failures, fear is the failure for type B personalities, the people that overanalyze things and can't take action. But the opposite of fear, which is the failure of type A personalities, which cannot take the time or will not take the time to look at the facts clearly before they jump. They just simply want something and they jump and they haven't looked at things correctly. So you think about people that don't fear anything. They really have no fear at all. Now, that's a dangerous situation in your life. And those people, they need to do something completely different. They need to stop and think things through before they do them. That is the problem. Now, the one problem with type A's is that they get bored very quickly. Analyzing things and figuring things out to them uh, is fun. They like making decisions. But once they make that decision, they become bored with it very quickly. So they're on to something else. And they continue to start a thousand projects and finish none of them. Now, the beautiful thing about type B personalities, if you can ever get them to do something, they'll stick with it and in most times finish it quite successfully. So for us to be successful in life, we have to live right in the middle of those two situations. We have to be skeptical enough to take a look at something and go, all right, what are the relevant facts here? What do we know? Uh, and once we know the facts are correct, this is when you just pull the trigger. That's what I do. I sit down on these real estate deals, like I did on these three classy apartment complexes, and I ran the numbers, and I ran them, and I ran them, and I ran them, and I asked questions on things I didn't understand and looked into things that I didn't know. And by the time it was all done, I figured out, hey, this is what the return is. That's it. So I went to the financial guy and said, okay, what kind of a loan can you get when the financials look like this? And they produced this kind of return. And they came back to me and said, okay, in this case, you can get this kind of leverage. In this case, you can get that kind of leverage. In this other one, you can get this kind of leverage. So now I had the knowledge of what was going to actually happen in the transaction. The only fear was, can I operate one of these properties? And then I realized, why would I not be able to operate one of these properties? Because of multiple reasons, I feel comfortable that I could. Number one, I could just keep the same management company in there right now that's doing it. I don't have to manage the thing. I just got to pick a management company. If there's one already in there and they're successful, it's very easy for me just to keep the same management company. Uh, number two, uh, Melissa has worked in Class A properties. She's done lease-ups. She's done all types of things. She's been... Uh, managing real estate for 20 some odd years and she's very good at it and she's done a great job with all the other properties I gave her and I've given her she ran four of my properties so far and did an excellent job with all of them so there we go that is another alternative possibility and the third alternative possibility is I go find an even better management company right somebody else that knows how to do it so you know when you look at this thing you go hmm what's left to keep me from pulling the trigger and the answer came down to fear alone. That's it. So at that point, you just make the decision, write the offer, send the offer in, and see where it goes. Now, my offer is on the table with a bunch of other offers right now. I'm sure that there's people out there, uh, you know, that are going to be going through the same thing I am, and they're making their offers, and they're sitting out there, and now it's up to the seller. There's really nothing you can do once you make the offer. Uh, the seller is going to pick the offer that they like the best, and they're going to take that. So now there's the fear of not getting the deal, right? Oh, my gosh, what if I put in an offer and I don't get it? Well, I know you won't get it if you don't put it in an offer. So same thing to you. Let's go back to you. What happens? What fear is it? I want you to write these down today. Just sit down five minutes while you're eating, have a cup of coffee, whatever, and write down, what are the five fears that I have right now that are stopping me from taking action towards becoming financially free. What are they? 
then correspondingly write down what are the five things that I need to do to become closer to financial freedom. Just five steps. What are the five things you need to do that you're putting off, you're delaying? And put those in order of importance. Which one has to come first because of the timing issues involved? Uh, which one should come first because of the arrangement of issues, et cetera, et cetera. And, and put them in an order of which they should be taken and dealt with. And then what I want you to do is I want you to write down for these five things that need to be done, two or three steps you have to take to get it done. In other words, I need to get pre-qualified. That's one thing I need to do. Okay. Second step. To do that, I'm going to need a financial statement. I'm going to need a balance sheet and an income statement to give to the banker. Right. I'm going to need to be able to show them a ledger of real estate owned. So I need to produce a ledger of real estate owned, et cetera, et cetera. I'm going to need to find a lender that specializes in the kind of real estate that I want to buy. And then I need to submit my application. And those are the three or four steps I need to take to start the process of getting pre-qualified. Because if I'm not pre-qualified, then I can't go buy a piece of real estate. So before I even worry about buying the real estate, let's get the steps done the easier ones that they're fear based, keeping you from doing it because you're not doing them because you fear what's going to happen in the end. Forget about what's going to happen in the end. Take the steps you need to take right now to start getting there. Because, friends, each time you overcome a fear, you have taken a step closer to a goal. You can't obtain the goal if you don't overcome the fear. So you have to put this into steps. There's an old saying I used to like all the time was, how do you eat an elephant? And the answer is one bite at a time. You just got to break it up into little component parts and take those steps. And as you take those steps, you get closer to where you want to end up. But until you take those steps, you're not even going to get started. You're stuck. So make the list of the five fears that you have that are keeping you from taking action. Make a list of five things you need to get done towards your financial freedom. And then take that list and break those five things. After you put them in order, break them down into a series of steps necessary to accomplish those. And when you do that, you're going to be able to move forward. Now, like I said earlier, I had an additional plan in place. And my plan was I wasn't going to keep doing that, which I knew I could do. You know, some people buy a rent house and go, wow, that was easy. And they stick with rent houses. I knew that for me to be where I wanted to be, I was going to need to own hundreds and hundreds of units to be able to make the kind of money I wanted to retire on. So what I did was I made a little plan that each and every piece of real estate I purchased would either make me more cash flow or would buy me more units than any other transaction that I ever did. So I bought a 10 unit, then I bought a 12 unit, then I bought a 30 unit, believe it or not, then I bought a 40 unit, uh, then I bought uh, a 64 unit, then I bought a 68 unit, then I bought an 88 unit, then I bought a 104 unit, then I bought a 140 unit, then I bought a 256 unit, then I bought a 270 unit, then I bought a 320 unit. And then, believe it or not, I went back because it was such a good deal and I bought a 140 unit again, just because it was close by the other stuff that I owned and it was a really good deal. And so I went back and did that. In other words, I don't need that plan anymore, is what I was saying to myself. I just need to fill in my portfolio because now, you know, I've got seven, what was it? I had eight apartment complexes or something like that at the time. And no, I think seven. I had seven apartment complexes at the time. And so it was just a matter of, you know, I had accomplished my goal. I'd gotten where I want to be. I'd overcome the size fear, the price fear, and so forth. And then one day I was sitting there thinking, hmm, market's peaked. I've owned this stuff for 15, 10 to 15 years between the different stuff. Maybe it's time for me to break that fear again and do something completely different. 
and that's when I decided I was going to start trying to figure out how to buy a Class A apartment complex. To be one of those guys that, that you see that wear suits. Now, I'm not going to wear a suit even when I own one. But these guys you see walking around in suits that own all these classy apartment complexes, tr- fly around in helicopters and stuff like that. I wanted to go to that next level. So for a year and a half now, I've been researching, studying, investigating, making offers on Class A apartment complexes. And a year and a half later, I still haven't done one. When we come back, we'll talk about why. We'll be right back with the Dell Wamsley Radio Show. You're listening to the Dell Wamsley Radio Show. Dell will be right back with more life-changing principles in just a few minutes. Welcome back. Now here's some more unconventional wisdom to set you free from the man on a mission to retire America, one person at a time. Dell Wamsley. Welcome back to the Del Walmsley Radio Show. Today we've been talking about fear and how it stifles your success in life and your progress. And we've talked about different ways to overcome uh, fear by breaking through it, not by making it go away because it never will go away, but by simply taking action anyway. Now, I posed a question for you uh, before we went to break, and that was, okay, I've been trying to buy a classy apartment complex for a year and a half now. Why have I not bought one? And the interesting thing is, there's one last coping mechanism that I had to overcome. And I finally overcome it, but it took a long time to overcome. And that is the fear that you're paying too much for something. The value of something is fluid. It changes. It goes up. It goes down. And when real estate prices go down, I get really comfortable with buying stuff because I'm thinking, wow, it's been worth twice this before. This is no no brainer to buy it for this price, right? But there's a problem. And I'll share the problem with you by sh- sharing the concept with you. When I was uh, buying single family houses, I found that I started at $25,000 a house. And... Um, Each time that I'd make an offer, prices had gone up a little bit. So it was like 25, and I'd offer 25. They'd say, no, we won't take anything less than 27. And I'd say, okay, I'll pay you 27. Then I'd go back next time and I'd offer 27. they go, no, we won't take anything less than 30. And that kept going on for a couple of years of buying houses. And by the time houses got up to $40,000 per house, I thought, man, this is just way too much. This is double what I started out paying for houses. There's got to be an end to every cycle, right? There's got to be an end. And so I stopped buying houses. Do you know over the next two years, houses went from 40000 a door to $100,000 a door? It just blew my mind. And I had stopped. I could have made millions of dollars, but I thought that 40000 since it was double what I paid, was the top of the market. Same thing happened to us when we started buying real estate during the recession in 2000. 7, 2008, John Ridgway and I were buying apartment complexes together at the time. We were partnering in deals. He was managing them, and I was being the lead investor. And we started out buying at 19000 a door. The next one we bought was 16000 a door. The next one we bought was 13000 a door. The next one we bought uh, was like 4000 a door. And then we put four in it, so we had it for 8000 a door. So here we were all of a sudden. We hit the bottom of the market, and the market started going back up. And we got offered a deal for sixteen thousand. We go, no, 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 no. We paid eight. We should, we're not going to go pay sixteen, and we missed the deal because we didn't take action. The next deal that came along wasn't offered at sixteen. It was offered at nineteen. And we're like, oh man, that's ridiculous. I mean, we we've never paid that much for this age of stuff. And then I had this conversation with John one day. I said, John, you know, we're going to regret this someday because I've already done this with single family houses. We're going to regret not buying at 16. We're going to regret not buying at 19. We're going to regret not buying at 25. So we had bought this property, $8,000 a door, turned it around, and we put three other properties on the street out of business. Uh, They got foreclosed on. The bank put them up for sale, and they came to us and said, hey, you bought this other one out of foreclosure from us. Would you like these three? And I said, sure, I'd be happy to give you 16,000 door for them. That's double what I gave you for this other one. Or actually I paid four. So that's, you know, four times more. And they go, well, no, nah, we can't take that. I said, why not? He says, because we've already got offers for 26,000 a door. 
And I'm like, wow, that's unbelievable. So I guess mine's worth at least 26000 a door. Then since yours are only half full, mine are full, they got to be worth at least thirty. Well, do you know right now that we've got one of those properties for sale and has in contract for $50,000 a door? We've got offers on the other two uh, that we bought in the same neighborhood. And the bottom line is we could have bought these for twenty six and now turned around and sold them for fifty. In fact, they were up for sale for fifty, and that's how we knew we should put ours up for sale. Um, what I'm trying to tell you is you are going to have this fear for the rest of your investing life that as things get become more expensive than they were when you started, you're going to have the fear that you're overpaying and that someday that's going to come back and bite you in the butt. And it is a big fear. I think most of us have it. At least most type Bs have that fear. And so for a year and a half, every time I would go after Class A, you know, we started out saying, okay, Class A's are worth, you know, 75000 a door. Then all of a sudden, they were 90000 a door. Then all of a sudden, they were 100000 a door. Then they were 108000 a door. Then they went up to 110000 a door. Then 115000 a door. Then 120000 a door. Then 125000 a door. Right now, John Ridgway has a Class A under contract for 180000 a door. And I mean... This is just blowing my mind that these things are going up so fast in value. And it took me a year and a half to realize that you can't buy what stuff was worth a year before it went on sale. You've got to buy stuff at what the market's willing to pay for it today. And so I'm psychologically at that point now. The fear's there, but I'm taking action anyway. And so when my friend sent me this article about fear... It made so much sense to me that fear is always going to be there the rest of your life. The only thing you can do is embrace it and take action anyway. And that's what I hope you figured out here today. I'm going to leave you again with those five steps. Figure out five things that you've broken through in your life that has changed your life radically because you had the ability to do to have the fear and to do it anyway pick five more things you absolutely would like to have happen in your life that are not happening because you have fear write down the fears that you have and then write down the steps you need to take to break through them hope this helps get you through the challenges that you have so that you too can start having the level of success that you not only desire but deserve. It all comes down to remembering. Fear is an acronym for false evidence appearing real. What you need to do is to just do it anyway. Have a wonderful day. We'll see you tomorrow. The information and opinions you hear on the Del Wamsley Radio Show are those of the host, Del Wamsley, his guests, and his callers, and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of this station, its affiliates, its management, or advertisers. The Del Wamsley Show is for entertainment purposes only. Please consult a professional regarding your personal investment needs. Nothing presented on the Del Wamsley Show constitutes an endorsement, recommendation, offer, or solicitation to buy or sell any product or security.